You may find this hard to believe, but 60 songs that explain the 90s, America's favorite poorly named music podcast, is back with 30 more songs and 120 songs total. I am your host, Rob Harvilla, here to bring you more true musical analysis, poignant nostalgic reveries, crude personal anecdotes, and rad special guests, all with even less restraint than usual. Join us once more on 60 songs that explain the 90s, starting Wednesday, May 17th, on Spotify. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. I need support staff to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch, an insurgent podcast unfairly maligned as extremist by the Coastal Masturbation Factory. I'm Chris Ryan. I'm an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me in the studio, his digestive system is part of the Constitution. It's Andy Greenwald! You on the Wamsgans diet? Whew. That was amazing. <laughs> Cocaine and wasabi, man. That's how we do elections in this country. In every orifice possible. Andy, I love this episode. I can't wait to talk to you about it. You seem shook one about it, and I love it. You know, we're just two snowflake libtard cucks. Brother, what <laughs> I, I'm like King Eunuch of Cuck Mountain. What, what does he say? <laughs> Here's the thing. Yeah. I'm the problem. Hi. It's me. I'm yeah. the problem. It's me. <laughs> yeah. So I found this episode excruciating <laughs> to watch. Yeah. That is not a comment on its quality. Perhaps, actually it is. It's probably a, a commendation of its high quality. I am wishing a little bit, like usually, you know, people, some people maybe tune into us as soon as they're done watching. That would be very nice. Sure, yeah. But often we record with a little bit of breathing room. You know, uh-huh. like like we've we've walked out of Ringer HQ. Processed. We've, we've, we've declared some winners. You know, we've made the call. Mm-hmm. And then we sleep on it. And then we talk. Sure. I watched this episode. We get Darwin in to crunch the numbers. Yeah, I, I wish we had a Darwin. What a name! It's kind of Kaya. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just watched it this morning, and I'm I'm shook up. Yeah, I'm I shook up. I by think this that's episode. the goal. Uh, this episode, America decides, which it did not, because it was decided by three uh, maniacs with father issues, mm-hmm. uh, is about the election. So, just briefly to kind of give people context, it's been. A thread throughout this season mm-hmm. mentioned a lot, but obviously in the third season, we had a lot more insight into the horse trading that goes into picking at least the Republican nominee. Mm-hmm. Um, remember uh, what it takes was the sort of dog and pony show where mm-hmm. we're sort of first really introduced to Mencken and, and Roman's um, sort of disturbing fascination with Mencken, who is played by Justin Kirk in an amazing performance and is kind of this philosophizing, uh, hard right, like, professorial but also like super racist guy who quotes H sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And Macon is in the polls in the show. Professorial so, like Liberty U, right? Yeah, like, for sure. Yeah. Um, University of the Streets. As we get to election night, Macon is trailing the Democratic nominee uh, Jimenez by a couple of points. And we could tell by polls. his first appearance on the show that he would be back a lot. Yeah, right. And as election night starts, you know, all hell breaks loose. Basically, uh, we're given a very, I would describe this as the most, the thick of it episode of Succession yet. The thick of it being Mm -hmm. the show about British politics that Jesse Armstrong worked on with Armando Iannucci before Succession. And that 
series was very famous for a lot of like you just pandemonium in an office setting, people running, slamming doors, calling five different phones at once, having secret meetings, those secret meetings then immediately being divulged. And I thought that the mechanics of this episode of Succession were very thick of it in the best possible way. On the flip side of that, you are essentially looking at the nightmare that has uh, engulfed all <laughs> Our, our democratic system yeah. in this country. Yeah. And I think it was also an amazing, hey, just so you know, this is who you're like rooting for kind of episode from Jesse. Like yeah. he wrote it and I thought any residual kind of feelings people had about whether or not they're like cheering for or who do you want to have come out on top or who's who's kind of like your fave here. Uh, it's hard to get up in the morning and be like, I'm a Roman guy. I mean, you know, after Crystal knocked, you know, <laughs> all bets are off. Yeah. I mean, these are despicable, pathetic, weak monsters who are actively ruining the world. And they always have been that. Yeah. For the sake of good TV. For the sake of one night of good TV. Yeah. This was, in many ways, what this entire series has been aiming for. And it's reached that place with two episodes to go, which was to almost, and we've commented on this in terms of the aesthetics of the show, in terms of the production of the show, and in terms of the storytelling of the show, to take these characters who are so walled off and siloed from quote unquote real life that we can poke at them and laugh at them and examine them almost as if they're behind glass in a museum because they are so far removed from anyone's actual life and their interests and their their follies are just preposterous. But contra Roman, mm -hmm. I don't think it's true that nothing matters. Um, <laughs> things, <laughs> things happen. Yeah. And there is an effect. And there is a trickle-down effect. And you you prove that by donating so so thoughtfully to Amy McGrath's campaign. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think we're still counting some ballots. You know? I just think Mike Espy has a shot the third time. Sure. That's what I'm committed to. <laughs> I'm sure I'm just going to get six more texts <laughs> off that one. Um, <laughs> look, it was really hard to watch. Not because I had a particular rooting interest in America's favorite young fascist. It was particularly because, and I was thinking about this, like what tends to be the tripwire, what tends to trip things up in art or entertainment when it gets a little close to reality. Yeah, and, I, I wanted to ask you about this. Yeah, and so one of the things that I think is the problem is when you have programs like Extrapolations on Apple TV+, Plus, for example, uh -huh. or, I mean, we always pick the same straw men punching bags, and I apologize because these are noble pursuits. I, you know, we often mention the, the last season of The Wire, too. Mm -hmm. And I think what we find a little bit jarring about those shows is that they are... They come, they begin from a place of earnestness. They are, in a sense, polemics, you know, that some people are good and circumstances are bad. And why is no one paying attention to this? Why aren't we more aware? Why aren't we more aware of bad things happening and good people are being silenced? And I think that that can be jarring because in our lived experience, donating to Act Blue daily, <laughs> um, for instance, for just hypothetically. Yeah. <laughs> Um, or, or like being out in Maricopa and just making sure everything is going according to plan, right? Just eyes on it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Just right. watching. Arms folded from the, from the corner. Just giving up very neutral vibes. Wearing a, a crisp white shirt yeah. tucked into slacks. Yeah. Yes. Depleted khakis. Yeah. It's fine. <laughs> can, can a riot be too bourgeois? You know? <laughs> uh, who could say? Um, that our lived experience doesn't often track in terms of like pure good or pure bad, mm -hmm. or that there's forces who are doing their best with earnestness and, and malign forces. What this show does so excruciatingly is just turn a camera on the rotten to the core cynicism of everything. Mm -hmm. That rings true. That there is this like, what does Kendall say? I, does the poison drip down? Does the poison yes. drip through? Yeah. I, I'm, I'm misquoting it. It's, but, it's, but it's when he was asking, uh, and, and, and honestly, the probably the most cliched prestige mm -hmm. TV moment that the show has really done is this like, am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Conversation that he has with Shiv, which is really saved by the fact that they're both lying to one another. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I mean, I want to talk about that scene specifically, and we'll get to it, I think, when we talk about more of the emotional heft of the episode. But that really, 
the way terrible things happen in the world is enough smart people standing around going, that's crazy. Yeah. That's crazy. Right. All I'm doing is just telling another or person enough something that someone told me to do. people who are in the situation that Jess and Greg find themselves in at the end I, of the episode. I, I, which it, is a really interesting scene, I thought. In an episode of brilliant storytelling choices, elevating Jess, who is played by a really strong actress, and Juliana Canfield is her mm-hmm. name. She was on Why the Last Man. She's been on a lot of things. She doesn't get scenes like that often. No. And what we did was we went from literally upstairs to downstairs for a moment. And these are the people who history will not necessarily remember. The books that Gabriel Sherman at Vanity Fair write about the infamous Mencken election, like probably won't talk about their role in it. But that was a human moment. Right. And it's um, even that idea, it's like, I thought what they talk about in that scene seems to be like, you know, Greg is basically this bag man. He's not, Greg not going downstairs is not going to stop Mencken from winning the election or being declared the winner of the election. But they almost for a second are like, do we take a stand here? Like, do we just sort of like, you could always wait for a minute and not do this? And, you yeah. know, Tom's right behind him. Tom is... No, this is the yeah. modern condition. Yeah. Like, it, it, if the the wheels are greased, like, what does stopping, what does slowing things up do? Yeah. What can any of us actually do? It History isn't made... Like, I mean, I feel like history isn't made by, like, Sienna Miller saying the right thing to a whale that talks in Meryl Streep's voice. History is made it's not, by... It's not made that way. Well... You know, we can circle back. <laughs> That's TBD. But it is made by 10,000 seemingly ben- banal or benign decisions, right, that lead to this suddenly inescapable moment. I mean, Roman is you know, <laughs> the famous, like, William F. Buckley thing about conservatives standing on the battlements yelling, stop, uh-huh. right? Like, he's standing up there with a bullhorn and a fire hose saying, go, 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 yeah, go. Yeah, I mean, like, the, the he, actually, there's a great line that where I think Tom says to the kids, the siblings, as they're sort of invading mm-hmm. the newsroom, he's like, generals aren't supposed to be on the battlefield. Like, you know, there's always, mm-hmm. like, a, a rule that Logan had that we stay out of, like, the news gathering. Now, obviously, that probably could be, in Logan's day, switch, fixed by just calling Sid and yeah. saying, like, I want this. I mean, we were in the room with them in what it takes in season three, where they essentially just pick Mencken. There's no yeah. democratic process. No. There's no, they're just deciding between the vice president and Salgado and, and Mencken. And he's just like, we're going to go with him because Roman has convinced me that he is a T-Rex who's going to do blockbuster business. And when they decide at the end mm-hmm. to pick this guy, not only is it rooted in the f- trauma of losing their father, but it's also rooted in he's good television. And he'll do the he'll thing do that business. they want in the deal. He'll, and, he'll, yeah. and, and, you know, they're just... It, it's incredible the weakness in these characters. Kendall especially, and we should go through the siblings. But, like, they are like the rest of us, being like, there are guardrails. The markets will hold yeah, them the in Yeah, the markets check. will hold the leash. Yeah. Uh, why? Yeah. Why? Right. There were guardrails at your fake news network that didn't even make it through dinner time. They didn't even make it through the first round of bodega sushi delivery so before being destroyed. It's interesting that you brought up this idea of the uh, reality within succession mm-hmm. because so much of the show takes place in these places that 99.9999% of us will never ever even get a sniff of. You know, these luxurious estates in Scandinavia or in Palo Alto or, you know, or like Santa Barbara or, you know, Croatia or wherever they're going. It's just like no one's ever even going to catch a glimpse of this Yacht place. Life. Yeah. But this is the closest I think that this show has ever been to. And with the exception of some of the Ravenhead stuff in the past, mm-hmm. this is like, this is what it's like to work at Fox on election night. Mm-hmm. But it's Jesse's vision of it. Mm-hmm. So, of course, it's kind of the dials are turned a little bit. You've got people doing cocaine behind the whiteboards. You've got touchscreens breaking. And you've got these crucial inflection points where actual real events are being processed and then contextualized to suit certain narratives, right? Yeah. And that's how the sausage is made. But the sausage is being made by one crazy butcher in, in Roman. You know, I mean, it really is. He is just like a force of nature that's bowling over the entire process here. Yeah, I mean, also, it's a reminder that everything everything actually is a choice. It's not like there's just some tube of truth that you turn on and what's on there is impartial and it's just being fed to you and, you know, they report, you decide. Yeah. Every single thing that makes it in front of your screen is a choice. And I think for as much as, I mean, you're right to say this is Jesse's vision of it and I think there are aspects of it that are tweaked and there are some 
helpful and necessary respites of comedy, you know, with the wasabi and everything. But I think broadly, this is true. They are making, this is a sausage factory. Yeah. And uh, they're making the product that they want and how it gets covered and the slow drip of how it gets covered too, right? Like, I can't believe I'm saying this. As I'm talking to you, I kind of want to watch the episode again, just, yeah. just structurally, because the first men, you know, it, it, it does these little, it does these very smart things where it's a slow drip of, is there some intimidation? Well, we're not sure. Is there some unrest? We're not sure. But it's rooted initially, once again, in Kendall's lived experience, his, his family experience, mm-hmm. right? Once again, Rob is like, I don't feel safe. Yes. But whose side is not making her feel safe? Right. Where is the where is the unrest coming from? Who is it, the architect of it? And at the beginning of the episode, it's revealed that it's Kendall, and he's doing it for the good of something. You know, he's asking for protection. And we end the episode where the root of the unrest once again is ultimately going to fall on Kendall. Right. It is his fault. But yeah, there's this sort of percolating feeling. What's the fire? Well, how are we going to report the fire? And oh, this is actually a democracy imperiling incident, or it's an opportunity, or it's a ratings. Right, Buster, and it, and it it just goes into the idea that basically these three, four, five people can be discussing something in a conference room, and then somebody can say it on a television screen, and then Macon can go on stage and say, uh, "A news organization of great repute yes. has declared me the winner of the presidency, and we must so so we must move forward as if that's the the truth." And and also these little phone calls between people, between the people decide, the people making news, the people reporting the news, the people deciding the news, the people in the news. This is real. This happens. This is not new. I mean, this is probably as long as there's been any kind of politics. Well, we just had it on, on somewhat of a, but uh, it broke the other way, but they, they Fox called Arizona. Oh, sh- for, sure. Yeah. No, no, know. I mean, but even before that, like this idea that there are guardrails that'll protect us from some things, like it's a slow erosion is, is what I mean. Like that, that stuff, like what you got for me, what can you do for me? The horse trading, the updates, the check-ins, the, this doesn't leave this room. And Darwin isn't finished saying that before mm-hmm. it leaves the room. You know, it, it, it's, I think the show does a very smart job highlighting the fact that what happens on this particular election night is not necessarily a symptom of the fail sun disease yeah. that has infected Waystar Royco. It is actually the, the end game of a much longer collapse. Although I would say that a lot of what motivates what happens is psychologically rooted in the, <laughs> yes. the multiple betrayals within that family rather a than million. Kendall saying, I reject pluralism for the shareholder value of this company. I mean, he does what he does because he feels like he's been stabbed in the back by Shiv. So a, he a rejects percent. the opportunity to pull back the Wisconsin announcement and pump the brakes a little bit. And he goes full on into what Roman wants, which is making the victory. And Shiv is left out. Do you want to do Shiv... And Kendall's sure. scenes. Well, and Shiv and Tom scenes and Shiv in general in this episode was yeah. fascinating. I think it's also worth it's noting, It's a punishing though, episode for that character. It was punished. And for Tom or for Shiv? For Shiv. Well, no one comes out looking great, but I, I agree. I meant it was a punishing episode. Like, she is really put through the ringer in this episode. Yes. And, um, yeah, I, I was just going to say the difference between... It's it's worth noting again the difference between the kids and their father or his father the father's absence. To your point, it's not like Logan was, you know, some some great believer in the separation of powers in this country or anything. But we are reminded that the root of everything he did was his gut instinct for what was best. Yeah, I mean, they, they, it, it was it was savagely unemotionally encumbered. He didn't care. Yeah. He was out for what he thought was the best deal, always without apology or taking no prisoners and without any, any, um, yeah, I mean, he never deviated from that. Whereas every single thing that the kids do is filtered through an Instagram lens called dead dad. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's go through the, the beats with Shiv. Um, she, at the beginning of the episode is still double agenting with Matson. Mm-hmm. She's had this huge fight with Tom in the previous episode. And then after Tom does just a little pick me up of cocaine with Greg, as the election night starts, she has this incident with him where she starts by saying, like, I'm sorry. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to give you an opportunity to say you're sorry. And this guy who's high on cocaine and uh, and bodega sushi. <laughs> but he didn't touch the bodega sushi. It might have helped sushi. Yeah. cut the he, uh He's just like, what do you want? Like, what, what, like, what are we doing here? And she admits to him. She, she tells him that she's pregnant and he thinks that she's lying. I mean, this is, again... This is the genius of the episode. Something has to matter at a certain point. 
there has to be a bottom. There has to be a floor for these people. Not everything is a negotiation or an opportunity for advancement or a game. And this theoretically was that floor. Yeah. This is real. And that's what Shiv has been carrying. And that is, you know, again, I, I, I think it would take a, a, probably a different voice and also maybe a lot more time considering it to, to look into this idea that like Shiv being pregnant has suddenly given her a different moral uh, weight on the show. Right. Um, but I think it it has because if only for the, what I'm saying that it does seem to have created some. There's a limit. There's a limit to what she can accept, to what she can maneuver, and what she can do. And to have it be treated like that, you know, like another like another gambit, like like being outfoxed. Yeah. It's it was pretty incredible considering we walked away from last week being like this is the most savage, the most savagery we've seen on television outside of like mixed martial arts and the white caps episode of Sopranos <laughs> and there's still more to go. Yeah. It can get worse. Yeah. It can apparently always get worse. Well, so the reason why I, I thought it was really punishing to Shiv is her character has suffered the most because of the difference between time on the show mm -hmm. and time in the real world watching the show. Right. So Shiv finds out in episode four that her her baby is gonna is is past those tests. It's right? the opening of four, the post uh, Logan, and episode. she hasn't told anybody. Right. So that's now been almost a month in real time for, for us, us. But it's for been... you and for you and me and the people watching the show. We're like, Shiv's been sitting on this news for a month. Like, wouldn't she be showing? <laughs> and in reality, it's been five days or four, four days. Four days. And so when she invokes her father dying, I'm like. Are you kind of going back to the well on that almost? Yeah. You, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like that yeah. was actually my reaction in the moment is that she was struggling to like kind of gin up some sympathy from Tom or to win the argument. And she goes to the dad card. I'm like, well, actually her dad's only been dead for like less than a week. So it's totally reasonable that she would be like, why don't you give me a fucking break for yeah. getting in a fight with you last night? Like my dad is dead. I'm fighting for this company, blah, blah, blah. But for me watching, I'm like, it's been a month of my life of her kind of doing this, like, this it, double game. It is also, not to be a Tom defender, he's not wrong that it's a little bit bullshit. Because... You don't want to be Team Tom here? You don't want to just be like Wham Scams guys? I feel like... Disgusting brothers for him? I, I, I feel like there's some, there's some potential legal jeopardy to <laughs> align myself with Tom at this point going forward. I definitely think in, your act blue would get suspended. In the American project <laughs> yeah. that we're all working on. Um, no, I mean, she's... She's throwing shit at him as opposed to saying the truth, which is that she is hurting, that she's in a devastated, injured place. Yeah. My dad died is saying like, you know, it, she's, she's trying to cloak herself in things. Yeah, that like will, what's, that will... what's the, you know, it's like what lever can I pull here to stop this train? Yes. Like it, I want it, you to forgive me and now we are good and now we're going to be on the same team tonight. And instead Tom coked out is like, like you're telling me that you're pregnant and that you're trying to invoke your father. Like I don't know what, for you is a move and yes, like a, a faint. Yeah. And that is not unfair because again, instead of living with the emotional agony of literally everything that happened over the previous four hours, Shiv leaves that building being like, I will take this emotion and turn it into fissile fuel to destroy to my brothers. these guys over. Yeah. Right. It, it is, it is a ploy. Yeah. It always is. And that's the thing that is just so incredibly savage about the show is that everything and everyone is tarnished. When Kendall says what he says to her, he's not wrong. He's not all the way right, but he's also not wrong. Yeah. So let's talk. So that basically there's two Kendall Shiv conversations. The first one happens in a conference room as Roman is trying to essentially like close the ATN Mencken marriage and that they're going to basically like push him over the top by just declaring that Wisconsin is won by Mencken, even and though hundreds, a hundred thousand ballots are essentially on fire in this Milwaukee polling station. And all the details do mirror the real world in the sense that the analogs to like Newsmax or whatever mm -hmm. are out in front yeah, of Yeah, there's this. like a... They're getting outflanked on the right. They're getting the outflanked right. on the right. And that has always been Roman's concern. He goes to his father in, in, the, in season three and he says we can't be dinosaurs. We're going to get outflanked. Like, we need to keep the money machine going. And then we, like, revitalize ourselves by getting behind this Mankin guy and we go get Gojo and we go do tech. You know, like, we go, we're the T-Rex, we're the you know? And, and this is, this is also 
very much taken or at least skimmed from the top of Murdoch stuff. Okay. Right. Which is one of the Murdoch sons is just like, I've had brown shirts sized for all of us. Right. You and know? the other one is like, Avatar is a great movie. Yeah. <laughs> because it's also about saving the whales who yeah. don't speak like Meryl Streep in that movie, but should. Yeah. So Shiv and Kendall have a conversation that uh, is probably the most tender moment between the two of them since Safe Room, which also takes place at the ATN offices, if I remember correctly. And is this moment where Kendall comes to her and is pretty candid. He says, got to be honest, I've been thinking about doing this myself, you know, it's but I don't want it, that ambition Mm -hmm. to necessarily affect the family, our familial relationship. And on top of that, like, I feel like I'm getting railroaded a little bit here with the Mink and Roman fucking white power, power couple. And it's really disturbing me. What do you think? Mm -hmm. And he really opens his heart to her, I think. You know, I mean, he's being at least honest about what he wants, which is, I want to run this company, Mm -hmm. but I don't know if we can do this if, if Roman's doing what he's doing. Can you help me out here? And they have a conversation about whether or not he's a good person and a good father and like whether or not like his father has poisoned him. And I think it's that moment, which has always been something that I think I've struggled with with this show is, does anything matter, right? Mm -hmm. Like when you're watching a moment like that, when you see Safe Room, when you see a moment like this, is it going to have a consequence in the next scene? Or is what the show is saying is none of this shit actually matters. People can be quote unquote vulnerable with one another and it actually Mm -hmm. has no no knock-on effect because you can just keep bantering and keep running around and keep getting in private jets. So to have the scene at the end of the episode where Kendall basically discovers Shiv's double game and in one of my favorite scenes maybe of the series, confronts Shiv and and says, you know, when I asked you to call Nate and what was going on with Jimenez, Mm -hmm. you looked like a goose trying to shit out a house brick, I believe. That's correct. And then Strong, you know, I, I think Strong's the best actor on television. I think Kendall is one of the most amazing characters we've we've ever had on television. Mm-hmm. The way he says, you piece of dirt, is like kind of going to like stay with me forever. The way, because you can see he almost wants to call her a piece of shit. Yeah. But calling her a piece of dirt is like even worse. Yeah. And he's so fucking hurt. And Roman is so delighted. And that whole scene, I'm, I, I love this scene. Yeah. That whole scene... Culkin is doing such an amazing job of watching them mm-hmm. and he's he's so titillated. He's getting off on it. Yeah, because he's winning, but also because like everything he thinks about people is right. Yes, at the at at their core, everyone is just base. Yes, and he's like I'm the only one who's honest about it. I'm the <laughs> only one who's like you know what, like this guy, like what are we talking about? Like this guy is us. And again, the show has it both ways in the way that only great art can, I think. I think Kendall wants a conscience the same way he wants the latest Supreme drop. You know, <laughs> he, 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 he would love that. If you go back, if you run the tape back over the preceding three plus seasons of the show, what was the only time Kendall ever got what he wanted and was in some ways uh, calmed or at peace? Mm-hmm. And it was when he fucking killed a guy and his father hugged him and told him he was his number right. one boy. It's all he's ever wanted. And what's ingenious about the show is that it does understand that when we come to people with vulnerability or we come to people with emotional truth or admissions or whatever we want to dump on them, it is also transactional on some level because we want to be approved of. We want it to be rubber stamped. We want to be told it's okay or that it wasn't that bad, you know, and That's what was so interesting about those moments before that conversation where Kendall is completely spun out and Mm -hmm. undone because he has a vision of who he is and who he could be in the world and the leader type of leader he would love to be. And he's actually being forced with a moment. Like someone is leaning in his ear and being like, Mr. President, uh, a second plane has hit the tower. Yeah, right. You know, it's like, I just want to be here with my pet goat and have the kids love me. Yeah. Sorry, digression. But you know what I mean? (laughs) Everybody knows what I mean. Just cool 9-11 reference. Um, when he goes to Shiv, he wants a soul band-aid, you know? Yeah. I I love, I love, it's, it it remains my favorite running thing in the show when the siblings either talk about or do hugs. I know. Are we do, should we do one of these? You could do, uh, like a, basically a panel of all the hugs that they've ever had, you know, and 
when Shiv has got her eyes closed versus when she's yes. got them open, when she actually like embraces somebody versus just patting them on the back. Yeah. It's and, like the story of the show is told through the embraces in a lot of ways. And for as complicated as the dramatics of the show are, these people are so desperately, painfully simple. And everything is just an exposed nerve. And he gets what he wants from Shiv in that first scene. And then when she betrays him, nothing has penetrated. Nothing has sunk into the soil. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's also what he wants because it makes it easy. It makes it animalistic and reactive, right? It was yes and now it's no. Easy. There's nothing to it. And then he commits the country on a downward spiral to fascism. Right. Because his feelings are hurt again. On the flip side of it, with Shiv in those scenes, mm-hmm. I obviously have sympathy for her. Her her brothers are trying to betray her as well. They made sort of this unilateral decision that they were going to shepherd the company through the merger and then they, they would go mm-hmm. to ATN or Gojo or some combination of the two or Pierce, Pierce whatever, together. That there was going to be this, this family business that they embarked upon. And they completely cut her out and kind of never really like got into why or what they were doing with that. But... I understand her motivations for working with Matson, and I understand and definitely identify with what she's saying in that conference room about America. But I noted with interest that this is the second time that she's, when talking about the election, just sounds like a resistance Twitter bot. Well, but that's that's also, you know, Roman to Shiv in that scene is me watching extrapolations. <laughs> it is, you know, and, and I wish it wasn't. But I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Whales are good. I yeah. get it. Won't somebody think of the children? I mean, yeah. He it's horrifying. Yeah. And 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 that's but she's like the republic, but and there the comes thing. a time, and he's just like, shut up. But let's it's just the framing. Like what makes succession good is that it's about what Roman is doing and saying and how true that is, as opposed to what she's saying. Right. Because how do you Because Aaron sit Sorkin's in a room? version of it is Shiv yes. talks everybody yes. into stopping this catastrophe. Yes. She breaks into a, a just a brilliant one-woman performance of the first act of Hamilton. Yeah. Everyone applauds. Right. And um, then they all go to Shake Shack, the original one, <laughs> yeah. in Madison Square Park. You know? So it's like, it's cool. Yeah, it's so not you're, it's just a, who tells your story, you It's know? not corporate. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year, I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished. Because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three-month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw-dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. You might say all kinds of stuff when things go wrong, but these are the words you really need to remember. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. They've got options to fit your unique insurance needs, meaning you can talk to your agent to choose the coverage you need, have coverage options to protect the things you value most, file a claim right on the State Farm mobile app, and even reach a real person when you need to talk to someone. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Tax Act knows you don't look forward to taxes. Tax Act doesn't even look forward to taxes. And Tax Act is a tax software company. It's basically Tax Act's whole thing. If Tax Act did things over, maybe Tax Act would end up teaching kindergarten or leading fly fishing tours. But that's a different story for a different ad. So why don't we just agree that taxes aren't fun, but you still have to do them? Tax Act's filing software can help you do that. Tax Act. Let's get them over with. The friendship is sharing deal. Because I want one of your McNuggets. And I need some of your quarter pounders. There's a deal for everyone at McDonald's. Get one favorite like 10-piece chicken McNuggets, a quarter pounder, or a Big Mac and get another for just a buck. Price and participation may vary. Valid for item of equal or lesser value. Do you feel like there's a moment as they're sitting in the conference room watching Macon's speech, and I want to get to Macon in a second, (laughs) Yeah, where Roman's kind of like, we, all we did tonight was make great TV. Mm-hmm. And that's when Kendall's like, the market the market will be the leash and this is a guy we can do business with. And I think Ken, Roman says something like, nothing matters or something like that, but there's like a cut. And it's actually a not very typical succession cut. It almost feels like 
they don't really do inserts a lot, Mm -hmm. right? Where like the insert shot is like essentially like when you cut to like somebody's hand touching something or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it's not that per se, but it is almost a a atypical succession shot where Shiv says essentially things do matter. You Mm -hmm. know, I can't remember the exact line off the top of my head, but I should have written it down. And I, I thought that that was like a tone setter for that episode and hopefully for the next couple Mm -hmm. where this isn't going to be you know, at the next episode, everybody is just like, hey, so how, how are you doing since election day? Like, that was pretty wild, huh? You know, like... Well, what, what is insane is that the next episode is the funeral, which yes. is the next day. Right. Um, I do have some questions about the hangover remedies available I also to members some, of the upper just class. Just questions about, like, like I understand it was an, a nutty week, but could we have figured some different things out? Yeah. Could, I, could Logan have maybe laid in situ for a couple more days? I also <laughs> would have, and maybe we'll have a chance to bring this up with Jesse, like, Nobody would have been mad if he was just like three days later. Like, that's cool. <laughs> I'm okay. I'm okay not knowing what happened to them on Wednesday. Yeah, right. You know, right. Let's rest. Let's take it. Let's take a beat. Um, yeah, the Shiv part of it is is really interesting because it also is so deeply connected to the show's. I, I don't want to say real theme, but one of its most persistent themes is parenthood mm-hmm. and the responsibilities, generational responsibilities. I thought that her response to Kendall's prestige TV question of like, am I a good father? Um, was she's like, you're a good guy. Yeah. He wants to be. That matters. Not that much. Well, he wants to be, but he's not acting on it. I mean, it, there's always a difference between intention and behavior, right? Like you can't be judged. He, he, Kendall would like to be judged on the content of his character, right? Like on his intentions. I would like to be a good father. I would like to be a good steward of this company and my father's legacy. I would like to be a disruptive force for good in the marketplace of ideas. Okay, but what has he actually done over these three and a half years? Um, Seen his kids three times, had a few too many limoncellos, and shown a disturbing proclivity for floating in dangerous bodies of water. That's pretty much his... Yeah. Oh, and he killed a guy. Yeah. Yeah, that happened too. So that's that's the difference. I think that if they were in any way self-reflective or self-aware, which would make for terrible television, so I'm glad they're not, you could articulate the idea that how could he be? Mm-hmm. What has ever been modeled for him? So, you know, he, he, he's educated himself enough and moved the needle enough to be in a position of, I wish I could do this, but he has no tools and he has no interest in acquiring the tools. So when she's like, you're okay, that seems fair. Yeah, and I think that seems fair. So, do you think that when he comes to her and he says, "I asked you real questions," or like the first thing he yeah. says to her when he walks in back into the room? So basically, what happens is Kendall asks Shiv to call Nate and get Jimenez's promise that they will scuttle. They'll also the block the deal. Gojo, Gojo deal. So, so, so then it's a pick him. It's yeah. both sides will give him what he wants so he could be a good guy. Yeah, and then Shiv goes into another room, but within sight of Kendall, and pretends to call Nate but is on a, like, you, the line you have called is busy. Or, do you have to do that with a cell phone? Like, I would just hold it to my ear. Yeah, I guess that is sort of silly that she pretended to call a number. I think she could also have, like, legitimately called Nate and just been like, how's it going? Sure. You know? Yeah. Uh, whatever. I don't, I'm not quarterback in that. And then... <laughs> what succession got wrong yeah. <laughs> about lying <laughs> making, about calling your ex-boyfriend? Calls. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they're in a conference room and Kendall's like, well, I'm going to call Nate. And I'm just gonna just to just to kind of get some some time with him. And Shiv has her world blown up. Sarah Snook's face oh, yeah. in that scene as she's watching her brother discover not only that she's been lying about the Nate call, but then quickly put together that she's obviously working with Lucas because she's not trying to scuttle the and, deal. And where did that come from, though? Who betrayed her? Greg. I mean, Greg had quite a come up in terms of his influence. It was an episode. interesting Greg episode. Mm-hmm. And then so Shiv walks back in and the first thing, or Kendall walks back in and the first thing that Kendall says is, I'm a good guy. Yeah. You know, like you played on my heart. You yeah. know, like you tried, you made it personal by relating to me as my sister rather than as my business adversary slash partner. Yeah. And now I'm going to, fucking destroy you and now I'm going to destroy this country in the process and I wonder whether we're supposed to think in Kendall's case as he's sitting in that SUV on the way home uh, and he says some people just don't know how to make a deal Yep. if he thinks to himself like the way I protect Sophie the way I protect my kids and the way I protect this country is by being as in power as possible as having as much power as possible 
Or if he just doesn't think about that at all and he's just like, I win. No, he's a tiny, weak person who's like, I'm going to be a big, strong man by doing the biggest, strongest, biggest, loudest, meanest things. It's yeah. like someone who you know, has 30 guns in their house where their children live because just in case. Like That's actually a lot more dangerous, I think, yeah. to have the guns in the house, but you, know, you do you. So... I imagine, legally speaking, that's probably uh, like the CNN building that Shiv walks out of because of Warner Discovery issues. Yeah, probably. But it sure looked like the Fox building. It really did. The one on Fifth Avenue. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. If you're walking up and down New York in Midtown, like up around there, you can, you just walk by these huge news corporations. The Chirons. Yeah. All, all hours. Yeah. I, I, um, you know, I guess retroactively, I'm a little bit Team Logan because... (laughs) And I think the show, by the way, Who guessed? I think the show has also been surprisingly consistent in that, that I think the show's argument, such as it has one, is that he was phenomenally, consistently successful in a corrupt and inhuman arena, but he was the best at it. And yeah. he never, ever, ever walked into a negotiation and said, I'm a good guy. Or he never walked in or out of a negotiation being like, I was on it, you know, I was vulnerable to you. Yeah. And you took advantage of it. That's just, they were were always speaking a different language to him. And now they're the ones running shit directly into the ground because it is all, all emotional. Yeah. It is all emotional vulnerability. Even when it's not, even when it's performed aggression, like what Roman's doing. I mean, it's, it's, it's just vulnerability. Uh, I want to talk about one more depressing part, and then I want to talk about how funny this episode was in a lot of ways. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The depressing part is, are we sure Mencken would get to that point in, like, national politics? Like, that guy's pretty weird. Fucking yes. What? Hello? Well, I, I, to me, he, like, re- resembles Blake Masters a little bit. Yes. They, okay. And that guy got fired into the sun. Like, he got s- smoked. I, I, I do. Okay. I see what you're saying. There, <laughs> yeah. there, there, is a, there is a point here, right, where, like, I, I would actually find it more not believable, and maybe this doesn't matter, but if it was somebody more on the like just really lunatic MAGA fringe but, kind of thing. But I think the one thing that we're we're under, we're beginning to understand, certainly not too late, like <laughs> right on time, <laughs> is that you know the 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 fringe fascism is it's it's great. People love it. You know, it polls super well in some places. Yeah, but the mouthpiece matters, and people love a big brain showman clown entertainer sure. like that's that's really like if you take the same ideas and you put them in a super creepy like incel nra slash mba from harvard body it's not going to have the same effect you know it's the sort of the desantis thing where it's just like the, in, the like the institution the institutional party is just like this guy's a better uh vehicle right for our ideas and then they trot him out on the big stage. And, and it's like a Westworld robot, like malfunctioning. Just not ready for prime time. Yeah. I, I do think the show kind of gets that wrong, but maybe it the- almost seems like honestly, somebody who would be who would pop off it it's he seems a little bit almost closer to Boris Johnson than he does to a Republican who would actually win here. Well, I th- I think it's interesting, right? Like it's yeah. an, it, clearly, even though he hasn't had a lot of screen time, there's an interesting thought process in the creation of this. Golem, like that he, you know, that he 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 he's a little wonkish, but like in the type of Christianity where everyone had swords, also, yeah, that I'm not really familiar yeah. with. That is an interesting choice that appeals to certain segments of America that I'm terrified but of. Not like a plurality that would probably get you. Well, I, don't, I don't know why I'm like saying no, like, no, there's but no I think, way this guy could win the presidency. Yeah, no, I, I, I think, but I think we would. It's just such an interesting character choice, right? It, like, it's like there's, I think that there has to be somebody, the way he's written, the way Justin Kirk looks, the way Justin Kirk plays yes. it, the ambiguously sexual relationship that he and Roman yeah. seem to have, like biochemistry wise, where yes. they're like communicating with their penises in mm-hmm. in these small rooms, like all of that is like very 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 awesome and provocative and I love it. It's really more like, I I was just like, are we sure that this guy like talking about like the, the grace of, of democracy coming through him and stuff like that. Things getting clean. Yeah. Clean, clean, clean. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's in fact, it's the opposite. I think, and I, and this is interesting. I wonder because so much of this episode was, I thought correct, even though it came from a very distinctly British 
mm-hmm. point of view. And some in the same way that Veep, which was also a bridge who had worked on the thick of it, was had kind of a necessary angle because it took none of it seriously in a way that, you know, our American political shows prior to Veep tended to be West Wing or House of Cards where everyone was either pure good or, or lawful evil. Yeah, right. Um, and Veep's like, everyone's a clown. So I think that it it got a lot of the American spirit right in that uh, in that sense. But I agree with you. To my mind, the character, and listen, we're not, we're not doing this. We are not like what succession gets wrong about Republican politics, <laughs> although a little bit we are. I think actually what would have been kind of interesting is if the figure had not necessarily been Trump-like, but had been like, you know, Richard Trumka, the labor leader. Yeah. Like, like who is going to win? Who's actually going to w- have a chance in Wisconsin? Right. And it's probably not creepy professor. It's probably a guy who can capture the white working class vote, but then also well, maybe be, he could. You know but, what I mean? But, 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 but also, I feel like he's almost written to the point where it's like he's got to be almost attractive to Roman. That's the thing. He and, is there for And Roman. I'm like, would Rome, the person that this Roman is, right. is attracted to actually be a viable political candidate, even in a post-Trump world. And I think we've answered the question because this show, as much as we've spent today talking about what it's saying about the, you know, the rotten core of America, the show is about this family and it is about the characters and that's what matters. And so you had to have a figurehead that would appeal to Romans specifically, like who can crush his opposition with a smirk. Like that is what Roman wants to be. You can't have that person be the mouthpiece of the peasants that he, you know, that's literally what he calls the voters. That wouldn't work. It would be interesting for them to try to corral a wild stallion yes. and lose it. But I think ultimately, I think you're making the right point. It is, the show suggests that everything is just about A, relationships, and B, about fucked up emotional family vulnerability and what appeals to you right. and what turns you on and what what empowers you. Like even when Roman is getting his way at the end. And the first thing he kind of says to kind of usher Shiv off the stage is like, your past doesn't even work in here, you know? And he's like, sort of like, you're not, you're out of the club, basically. Like, it's almost childish. It's almost like you can't play with us anymore. It's also doing the thing that I think only the elite television shows do, which is really get its arms around something that can be very problematic in storytelling, which is the engine of TV, especially serialized drama is change. Mm -hmm. Everything has to change. What's happening next? What's happening next? But the essence of human beings is that people kind of don't change and they kind of are who they are. And so the way Succession has solved this problem, I think, is that it's just changed the stakes around the people. So it's one thing for Roman to explode a satellite and slink into his chair because he doesn't actually matter. Mm -hmm. He's not in power. No one's listening to him. Uh, He can't bend anyone's ear. He just blew up a, I believe, unmanned satellite. Yeah. Well, the guardrails are off and he just blew up the United States of America. Same person. <laughs> Hits a little different. Yeah. It's it a, little a little different. different. Um, let's talk about, I would say, the lighter moments. I don't know if you would, in the context of what happens in yeah. the episode, it's hard to say they're light, but I talked about the thick of it. I talked about the running around and the closing doors and the everything. When Tom and Greg... Uh, do cocaine behind a whiteboard on yeah. election night. One willingly, one unwillingly. I'm just a simple guy. Yeah. You know, that's funny to me. That was real funny. <laughs> what was also funny, like we've been we've been really giving Matthew McFadden his flowers for his like profound, raw emotional performances. Yeah. But let's let let's really crush the tape on his face and eyes when Greg is like, do you want some of the thing that you asked me to get? Like <laughs> he, when he when he does the face of like how dare you? But it's, there are worse suggestions. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing. Um, what he asks for after they do cocaine, yeah, is I believe microwave ginger shots, mm-hmm. spaghetti with olive oil, and yeah. American bottled water. <laughs> and uh, I want to just say thank you to Jesse Armstrong. That yeah. is a very specific post cocaine food order. Yeah. Uh, I think it's it's a little bit, um, maybe your eyes are bigger than your appetite in that moment. Yeah, I think there's an essential oxymoron in the post-cocaine food portion of that sentence. Yeah. You know, that doesn't necessarily track. Um, I would like to, could we... F- the idea that he does cocaine and he immediately sits down for a meal is shocking to me. That's unexpected. Yeah. Could we CC this portion of the podcast to whoever provides the snacks here at Spotify HQ? Like, you know, just... 
just maybe just some little. I pasta think that that would be a good bit for you is to start walking up to Bill and, and asking for American bottled water and spaghetti with olive oil and seeing how he takes it. He's in a great place right now. So. Yeah, I think let's let's see. I mean, by the time this podcast airs, he either will be or he won't be. Yeah, and either way, it's funny. And either way, we'll be. <laughs> We'll either want the pasta or we'll want the alternative, <laughs> considering how the Celtic Sixers series goes. So, okay, fair. Uh, that part was 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 very funny. Yeah. I want to give a special shout out to, well, this is a running thing. I mean, one of the things that makes Succession the best in the biz is the Rolodex and who they call when they can call anyone. You want to talk about my guy, Adam? Adam Godley, yeah. uh, who one of the great British actors of our time, one yeah, of the great British faces. currently in like this amazing play, The Layman Trilogy, that's been in England and it's been in New York and it's, yeah. He's on The Great yep. as the priest. You've seen him in a hundred things. Here he is as Darwin. Um, <laughs> the aptly named. The aptly named Darwin, head of the decision desk. And that, he's amazing at it because he at once embodied where I thought it was going to go, which was someone has some conscience. Mm-hmm. Someone will do the thing that would make no sense to the Roys, which is to say, hey, hey, and then get fired or whatever. Yeah. It doesn't go that way because he gets wasabi in his eyes. No, it doesn't go that way because they offer to put him on television. Great point. Yeah, they put him on television. They're starts- like, what if we put somebody on TV to explain? To explain and that's when he stops. And that's when he's like, uh, I could I could do that. You're, it's a great call. <laughs> I did. I did want to make the pivot to the what was also truly funny, which this is this is just like because we're doing Greg, this, we're recording this the day after yeah. uh, they put Trump on CNN, mm-hmm. right? And it's just like, well, was, how how could you do that? It's just like all those motherfuckers did that. They all were like, I want to be on television. Yeah, no, because because it got ratings, yeah. and because what's everyone talking about today? CNN. <laughs> That's right. Good job. <laughs> Good job, PT Barnum. <laughs> There's no way the lions will escape this circus. Um. But I did want to say that Greg pouring slightly lemon flavored Lacroix directly into his—it's one of the fucking funniest eyes. things. Like I couldn't believe it. Like when <laughs> when he pour, he's like, it's just slightly lemon flavored. It's just a, he takes a sip. The best part about that scene is so uh, Darwin has wasabi in his eyes, yeah. and then he has Lacroix in his eyes. Yeah, and the entire time Roman's just looking at his phone. And this is a tick that Kieran Culkin. I don't know if it's like in the script or if it's just like his thing. But he has a tendency to troll the shit out of someone. And then when they start reacting, Mm -hmm. just start looking at his phone, Mm -hmm. which is something I have to say my wife does to me when we fight. Oh. And I don't love it. Wow. That's so 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 she's only there for the 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 airing of grievances, not any sort of response or blowback. She'll take so she's a sports radio caller. She takes her her answers offline. She takes it off air. Yeah. Uh and it's but Roman does that really really well like when he's like well, he's just looking at his phone while this guy's like my eyes my eyes and Roman's just like texting to be fair that's kind of what happens when I don't like a show you like and you check your email yeah it's very similar I'm like this show is bad for humanity and you're like oh DoorDash has a deal today how much is the pasta with just olive oil yeah, all, all NBA came out huh oh, oh, Jalen Brown's gonna get paid yeah super max uh what else was funny about this episode? <laughs> I mean, I, it was, it was interesting. You know, this isn't so much funny, but again, it's just, it's just structure. And I, I still geek out on imagined conversations, which is, for example, they're in the writer's room and they're looking at their big board and they're plotting out this episode. And then if their writer's room is anything like most, mm-hmm. you have headshots of your regular cast on the wall, both because they're looking down on you, but also so you can always just sort of think of their faces Think of them saying lines, but then also so you don't forget about them. Sure. And you're like, what's that person's business this episode? The entire C-suite, right? Like the executive level, like the, the Frank, Tom, Jerry's like, I don't think Jerry's in the episode. No, but it's Hugo, Frank, Hugo's and there. Carl. They're there. And I think there's maybe a total of two cutaways. Mm-hmm. And You have to imagine they may have shot like a basically like running commentary from that group and they used what they needed to use. I, I thought it was That's really- That's fucking awesome. I thought it was really interesting to hear- Chris, I don't know if you know this, but I listen to two to three other podcasts. Fresh Air, um, the Bill Simmons podcast, and yeah. What the Fuck with Mark Maron. Yes, although I also listen to Philly Special. Thanks. With Chris Ryan, I listen to NBA show. You know, sometimes I sprinkle in a little Rusilla. Yeah. You know, because I just love, sp- I love sports. <laughs> um, but J. Smith Cameron, who plays Jerry, was on, was on Maron. Okay. And she was saying- say she was on Rusilla. God, I wish. Ryan, make it happen. The off season. <laughs> Um, she said, we've heard this before, but it was interesting to hear it again. 
just the degree to which they fucking roll tape. Now it's worth saying, again, this is the craziest flex that I and forget they shoot every on season. Film. They fucking shoot on film, yeah. which is just wild to me because no one does that anymore. And if you do do it, you don't shoot it the way they shoot Succession, which is apparently we just roll morning to night and then we decide what the episode is later. Yeah. And they don't just roll because they give everyone like, you know, improv takes, which they do. And apparently, you know, that's where the Jerry Roman stuff came from was just Kieran and J. Smith Cameron riffing. Um, but it really shapes it. So I think, anyway, all that is to say, they definitely ran on that. But I thought what was used was so appropriate because these are spectators with vested interests, kind of, mm-hmm. kind of. And the most telling moment of all that for me was the the lingering on Fisher Stevens, on Hugo, who's who's also bored because his life is public relations. Yeah, he doesn't right? care who he's doing comms for. No, but he also doesn't care who's leading the nation. He wants good content. Yeah. Which is pretty much what America <laughs> wants to, whether it's TikTok or whether it's, you know, in the White House. So that was artfully chosen and damning. What was funny about the episode, Chris, was the rise of the conheads. The fall, but also rise of the conheads. Alas, Willa. <laughs> Alas. <laughs> like... It's just kind of amazing when you have performers like Ellen Ruck who are like get in the huddle with the coach yeah. and the coach is like, here's the play I'm drawing up for you. And he's like, I got it. Yeah. I will run this. I, I, I'm i alone on Comedy Zone this know. week. <laughs> so, okay, I'll just take that. Yeah. I'll do that whole one. Like, we don't know if we won. We don't know. It's and then he becomes Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> Schrodinger's cat. He becomes also increasingly Shakespearean. Yeah. As if he's performing for someone. But then his speech is also low-key terrifying. Yeah. The conheads will have like their revenge, basically. He's like, you're going to need another teat to sup on. What does he say? <laughs> but also that they are all Roman, right? Like uh-huh. Roman is the most turnt of all this. The most like online, like low-key fash, you know? Um, Fascism is cool. He's the most not. of the moment. <laughs> yeah. Au courant, but this is the default place if you poke them, right? Which is how fucking dare you, you peasant. Yeah. That's what happens if you put a microphone in front of these people. And that also is the, that's what gives the that's satire what makes teeth. The, Greg's betrayal of Shiv, to the extent that it is one, the most fascinating. First of mm-hmm. all, you know, he had sort of said, I mean, he had been out with Matson, he had sort of been. Leaning mats, I think. He he drank things that were not meant to be drinks. <laughs> he had danced with an danced old man. With an old man. <laughs> and the old man did not want to dance. What does Tom say to him? Is like he's like, it's medically good for your brain. <laughs> are you saying that all Aztecs are stupid? <laughs> this fucking show, man. <laughs> really oh good. my god. Uh but yeah, when he betrays Shiv. <laughs> I kind of like. Call him racist for saying Aztecs are stupid. I'm sorry. Please continue. I I like the fact that he was like, you know what? I'm kind of tired of telling of people coming to me and saying that they're gonna remove my spleen with a butter knife if I do something wrong. Yeah. And I've I've I kind of I'm I'm gonna short my shiv stock here. (laughs) And when he walks by her and he does the Jordan shrug, you know. Yeah. It's fucking. It's it's gut shot. When uh, (laughs) when when Tom. Fobs the phone off on Greg, and they're like, "We're not, we're not, we're not talking to Greg," and they all hang up. Yeah, uh, there's another really great phone part is when he comes in, and they're like, "Mankin, Mankin, Mankin," and Shiv's like, "No, please, no." Yeah, and he's got three phones in his hands, and he says, "It's not my call." Yeah, it's not his call. <laughs> he's he's doing the the Joe Dumars and one. Yeah. Right? That's three phones. Yeah. That's a lot of phones. Yeah. You got to get a lot of pick protections. <laughs> what, 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 what kind of shoes did, did Sid need to fit her cloven hooves in? <laughs> but, but, but also, I think you can really see the degree to which... Um, I mean, I made a joke about this at the beginning, but like Jimenez shows up for the first time, yeah. the governor. He's fucking boring. Yeah. I noticed with that he is not shot with much like care or, or like charm charisma yeah it's like hey ken well i'm gonna give you back to nate you know and jared is so much more you know he's in this lavish kind of yeah you know romantic room all right let's talk but but also his thing sorry his in some ways i I thought one of the most interesting and telling things is when he's like we're gonna pivot to losing but it's not losing right it's not we're just not winning yet yes um yeah it's narrative 
it, it's what what actually has power in a world where the only thing of value is content is narrative. So, and I, by the way, that is that going to be the new Spotify slogan? <laughs> Do you take Chris? Take that to Sweden. I will tell Daniel that was my idea. No, I would definitely say it was my idea. <laughs> That's fair. Um, last thing before we go. Okay, so next steps. Uh-huh. Uh, I love that when Shiv was like, she's going to go to the press, Kendall just gives her two thumbs up, like, for sure. Uh, and then she's just like, I'll tell everybody, you know, I would try to save the country. And, and Roman's like, mm, or, or are you mad about your boyfriend breaking up with you? And I guess my question is, what does Shiv have left here? Like, is she like, so obviously she still knows that her brother killed a guy. That's still And she there. knows that her other brother sold out the country to block a major merger mm -hmm. or acquisition. So those are two things that she could she, tell people. She also is still, I guess, on some level, the presumptive owner of PGN, a network that has pivoted to making Tom Wamsgans the enemy of democracy. Mm -hmm. Tom, whom she currently loathes, but is still... Yeah, what's up with PGN? You think they're like, father guys, of, is it the check? You guys are going to send the check soon? Well, it's only been four days. I know. But... Nan is still <laughs> swirling and spitting in Santa Barbara. <laughs> You know, um, I, I was interested that like suddenly I, when we were first introduced to the Pierces, right, it was like Hearst family, right? It was like a Condé Nast type thing of like you, you assumed they owned that world's version of the New Yorker. Yeah. But then they have MSNBC too now. Mm -hmm. Or is that sort of like PBS plus? I, I think it's supposed to be like they're just like a liberal right. ATN. Um, we can so, wrap so, it up here, though. Oh, oh so but for next steps, like... I, I, I think that, as is often the case when talking about this show in terms of, like, wins and losses, you end up realizing that the it, it's a feature, not a bug, which is to say, what the fuck does Shiv want? Mm -hmm. What does it matter? What does any of it mean? And you could look at that in sort of a morass of two episodes to solve it, or you could be like, well, that's actually what the show is reminding right. us. This is This is where we're headed. This is the future that they have now chosen the stakes got really fucking real in the span of less than one american work week yes and um that's that's kind of a wrap like that's <laughs> that's on all of it kind of yeah i mean also not because remember the savagery of the satire that that jesse armstrong pedals is they're still rich yeah well that's the whole point that's like not going to driving home in his secure mm -hmm. car and he's talking to his chauffeur the same way that Logan ended his life talking mm. to his bodyguard chauffeur. It's just like, it doesn't matter if you're alone, if you're powerful. Yeah, he can't see his kids. Right. Can't talk to his kids. Um, he's scaring the shit out of his kids. One of his brothers scares the shit out of him, and he's at war with his sister. Mm -hmm. He's pretty much alone. Who do you think he voted for? Khan? <laughs> I think he... Sympathy <laughs> vote for Khan? Khan, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, all right, let's wrap it up. All right. Thanks for talking to me about Succession. Thanks to Kai McMullen for, for producing us. Thanks to Austin Gale for cinematographing us. Did Did you get any, like, so for you, I just got real bad November 8th, 2016 vibes. Like, it's still in my body. Yeah. Um, it was just hard. It, it didn't, I'm not diminishing the artistic achievement. This is a good thing. <sighs> it fucked with me, this episode. I, 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 yeah. It, it wasn't my favorite experience, November 8th, 2016, you know? Mm -hmm. Um... I think I have some distance intellectually from this show and what's like the real world. Yeah. And I thought that they they did some things in this show that were like okay, like it's almost like having guardrails up for the for the viewer. Mhm. Mm and they're like this is this is this is about something else, you know. This is about these three people trying to I mean, is that what happened on November November 8th, 2016 is like somebody was mad at their dad? Uh yes, and he was elected president. <laughs> so <laughs> Nailed it again, Jesse. What happened on November 8th, 2016 again? I don't remember, but I had a nosebleed the next morning and it wasn't for Tom Wamsgan's reasons. Can I go to ChatGPT and find out? Thanks to everybody for listening. We'll be back on Thursday.